Welcome to um, the chapter five or the second part of module two on provider payment. Uh, we could spend probably the rest of this semester and all of next semester talking about payment and the different ways to do it. Um, so my goal is really to just kind of give you an overview of how people get paid with managed care and some of the issues and controversies we have to deal with and um, try to just make some sense of a very complex area. Well, the first thing we have to remember, it's not a reimbursement, it's a payment. A payment is what you get for your work and um, it, you know, I don't really think profit is a four letter word and neither does he. Reimbursement is when you get paid for getting your back whatever your expenses are related to your job or whatever. Um, the difference is reimbursement really doesn't drive behavior, although if you paid your expense report it might, but paying, payment can drive behavior and basically it can it, it you would hope it would a payment structure would be designed to reward appropriate behavior, but that's not always necessarily the case. Um, physicians are not entrepreneurs, although some of them do have businesses, but they are professionals. Um, in in the old days, I used to like to call them peace workers. The last and very highly paid peace workers in the world because they got paid for what they do. Um, th there's been a big shift and most of physicians today are paid as employees and the MGA, the Medical Group Management Association, reports um, that you could see that the majority of physicians being hired out of residency almost at 49% are working for hospitals or practices and 65% of established physicians are sort of employees now. So the problem is how the health plan pays and how uh, in doctors get paid. The, as I said, there are fewer and fewer doctors getting paid, shall we call it, on piecework and it's becoming more of a salary incentive program um, as, as physicians are more of employees these days rather than owning their own practices. Um, this chart just shows you the very different ways that you can be paid um, for fee for service and capitation, which we will talk more about um, later on. But the whole purpose of these chart charts is to show you this is not an easy thing. It's very complex. Uh, fee for service was based on something called CPT coding, current procedural terminology, and payment is made after it's done when you give the doctor your insurance form. And physicians like this because the more they did, the more they got paid. Um, some of these fee-for-service ideas were used and are used in managed care. Uh, Coinsurance, of course, means that a member pays a percentage of the cost, and it's based on the fee schedule, not what the provider bills. And some of the newer services, like an electronic visit, are not quite as easily billed for yet, and we have to figure out what to do. So there was an old saying called usual, customary, and or reasonable. And this is basically how prices were set. And it basically capped a fee at 95% of the average fee in the area. So naturally, it caused people to raise their prices because I'd much rather have 95% of $200 than 95% of $150. And that's how you encouraged inflation. Um, it used to be used 
and determined by using these proprietary databases, including a company named Nginx. And NIAG is the New York State Attorney General, and they basically had a go go between and a court case, and basically it showed that the databases were not so good. So you would think, well, why don't we just pay what the physician bills? Well, that's not going to work. So we're obviously not, if we're a business or a managed care organization, going to give these guys a blank check. And fee schedules are kind of designed, obviously, to clearly define the limits of payment that managed care and other insurance companies are willing to pay. And a fee schedule can be set up to say how much somebody will pay for an for out-of-network care, which is really a big issue today and um, is something that has to be looked at. Uh, maximum allowable fees for each CPT code. Uh, and we're not going to give you a penny more over that amount. And if you're a participating provider, you're going to accept that as the most you can get. But if you're a non-participating provider, then in fact you can bill for the balance, which can be a problem. And then, of course, there's a special fee schedule. And that really means is, well, oh boy, they got us over the barrel. We can charge and get more than you want to pay us because either we're really, really good or we maybe control the market in healthcare here. So there are a lot of issues that are involved in this. And in certain markets, it can be kind of high. Well, one of the problems in paying docs that they try to work out is something called the relative value. And it was always often used in fee-for-service plans. And each part or each procedure in a CPT has a value to it. And the problem that they try to resolve is doctors get paid more for doing stuff than for thinking about it. Um, Sometimes the best doctor is the one who sits there and thinks and figures out exactly what's wrong with you. But he's not going to get paid as much as the guy who does 50 different tests on you and figures out what's wrong with you. But if I was the insurance company, I would want to pay the guy who figured it out without all the tests more. So that's one form of, of, of um, service or, or payment scales. Another one developed by Medicare, or CMS, Committee for Medicare, Center for Medicare and, Medi and, and Medicaid Services. And they tried to adjust how to pay doctors and other health care providers by how much resources it really required to do something. And that was done to partially address, I guess you can call it almost a perverse incentive to um, procedures versus cognition. Um, some of the commercial uh, and Medicare Advantage plans tried a multiplier of this to get uh, fair compensation for doctors. Again, these are just different ways of doing things. Case rates are kind of interesting, um, where we pay you a fixed payment for whatever you do. So often for those of you who might be parents or or no like an OB may just charge well all inclusive five thousand dollars for your delivery um, we have to take out your gallbladder three thousand dollars flat rate um, that's one way of doing it but then there's always the uh, hospital add-on charge and this is a way of frankly getting more money it's usually done by hospitals that hire physicians. Um, it can be done by faculty practice plans. Most payers say, no, we're not going to do that. And that's often uh, taken out. And uh, payers will just, just won't do it. And even um, if you're you know, in an emergency situation, they may not pay for it. Uh, this is kind of the same thing that, that bugs, bugs me. Um, and I actually stopped using a certain um, auto service provider because all of a sudden there was a, a shop fee on my bill. And I go, what's that? Well, that's a fee for the shop. I said, okay, goodbye. So this is not much of a surprise. 
Well, what are the pros of fee-for-service? It's pretty easy to understand. And it's pretty easy to understand if it's a, like a private company self-funded plan, like a point of service or a um, preferred provider. It's understood. There's no idea that, well, we'll pay you to do less. And it's easy to get data. The cons are, you know, we're still paying them to do more. We're still paying them to do procedures. Primary care docs are more cognitive, so they're not going to be as interested. And um, upcoding is something where, hmm, is this a simple MI or a complicated MI? So let's do more. And the thing that gets me crazy is unbundling. And the best way to explain unbundling is a few years ago, if you bought a ticket for an airplane, that included your bags and the soda and everything else. Now you buy a ticket for an airplane and you, there's an extra charge for the bag, there's an extra charge for the soda, there's an extra charge for getting on the plane first. I think that probably explains unbundling pretty easily to everybody. Capitation, the magic, magic word in managed care. And basically, it's prepayment, and you've heard this term PMPM, PM, and you'll see this a lot in managed care, per member per month. And it's basically given regardless of whether or not the member receives any medical services. It's, it's, a, it's a maintenance fee paid to the doctors. And it's usually used for primary care. Um, it doesn't vary based on services. They will be adjusted for age and sex because... Obviously, patients of a certain age will need more care. Patients of a certain sex will need different care. The payment will be adjusted by both the type of practice and the geography or cost of living. It's not really adjusted for severity, but with information technology, it eventually may be. And some specialty uh, internists, guys who are both PCPs, and a specialist may be capitated separately. They may get one fee for their primary care patients and a second fee for specialty patients. And to prevent a conflict of interest, generally they cannot get a specialty fee in capitation if they're their regular patients too. Well, capitation really has two kinds of risks. Uh, we're not going to worry about that per se, uh, but it's important to know uh, what kind of people are in my risk pool, including those who are non-users, me meaning people I'm paying, who I'm getting paid for, who are really not very sick or don't use the doctor much. And you also have to know exactly what's covered, what will be paid under capitation and what will not. You, you've heard the word, or you may hear the word, carve-outs. And what that means is, basically, this is extra stuff in addition to capitation that we will pay for. For pediatricians, it's usually vaccines. If you're an orthopod, an orthopedist, it might be something like, you know, extra money for the cost of the joint included in the surgery or physical therapy. It could be a whole host of things. So that all is another item that's in capitation but not in capitation and has to be factored into everybody's cost. Um, this slide just shows you how they figure it. Um, don't worry about it and we're just going to go right fat past it, but it just shows you one of the ways they figure a monthly payment. So there's also something called withholds and, and risk pools and most managed care groups will apply that regardless of how they pay. And a certain percentage of what they're owed is withheld essentially to the end of the year. And it's used by the HMO to basically cover cost overruns in these risk pools. And the risk pool is the group of people who, who you're taking care of. And if there is no overrun or if you don't use it all up, it's returned to the primary care practitioner as a um, additional payment or money that was owed him and uh, the risk can be on an individual or it could be pooled um, it's usually I think pooled 
and this is, I guess, somewhat of an incentive for the primary care practitioner to try to stay within budget. Um, fee for service can be the same thing, and part of the fees are withheld under the same um, same conditions and paid at the same uh, end of the year or whatever the period is. Um, you can have mandatory fee reductions where uh, it's used by both HMOs and IPAs when all the physicians are sharing risks and the fees are reduced across the board if the expenses exceed the projected budget or the actual budget for care. It's a very complicated way that these things are calculated. Um, anytime you see the word actuarial, you know it's heavy duty math. And uh, there can be combinations of many different risk pools. I wouldn't worry too much about them. Um, if you're not making them, you don't have to worry. Uh, pharmacy costs are basically a carve out. Once in a great while, they can be in the risk pool because some plans will say, well, this will encourage the doctor to write cheaper medicines or hopefully more generic medicines. Um, but generally, pharmacy care is, is carved out these days. Um, this just shows you a slide of all the different ways they can be done. And you should just know that there are pools for the referral uh, pos positions and hospitals and other care. So it's very complicated and it takes a lot to understand. And basically what I want you to get out of this slide is there's more than one way to share risk and the managed care groups and other insurance companies sure know how to do it. So at the year end, if the costs are higher, it's taken from that withhold. And as I said, if it's lower, it's returned. Uh, you can't be at risk for more than what was withheld. And like I said, if you're a primary care, the risk can be based on the individual doctor pooled by group, by, um, by region, or anything else they can think of that they can get the doctors or perhaps the hospitals to agree to. Well, what's an individual risk? That's when a physician is responsible for his own or her own patients. Um, unfortunately, luck can have a lot to do with it. What if you have somebody who has a catastrophic illness? And it, it becomes a problem. Sometimes the, you know, some primary care practitioners can game the system. Uh, just not take the really sick patients one way or another. And I don't really believe this would happen for two reasons. Number one, I think most doctors are ethical and care for their patients, so they wouldn't withhold treatment. Uh, but secondly, there are things called lawyers and malpractice suits and standards of care that are very clearly defined that I think limit um, uh, withholding authorization for needed treatment. A pooled risk is when it's it, when just like anything else, almost like a basketball pool where everybody throws the money in and everybody's in the game. Um, if the pool is big enough, an individual's pr uh, own pr um, actions may not impact it, so it may not be much of an incentive um, to to really get doctors to use cost-effective uh, therapies. And if you don't track individual results, it's kind of hard to make them mean anything. And it's kind of hard to help doctors improve their resource management if they don't know what's going on individually. Stop loss is an interesting thing. Um, it basically limits your exposure to loss. It's almost like an umbrella policy uh, where if you, know, you if you have a house and a car, uh, you can have an umbrella policy that covers uh, any expenses over whatever your limits are on your house or your car, like, you know, it's a $1 million policy. You often hear of Lloyd's of London. They do a lot of this reinsurance. And basically, it protects the practitioners from being literally destroyed financially if they have a patient with a terribly serious illness and um, the cost 
just blow their budget. Uh, and remember, they can be considered responsible for all the courses. So somebody comes in with a heart attack, ends up needing a $200,000 heart transplant and getting it, that's the kind of situation where a stop loss protection would um, be involved. Um, specialists may also be capitated, and they'll use many of the approaches that we've already discussed briefly. Um, it kind of works best with people doing a lot of work, as listed here, OBGYNs, cardiology, GI. And it may actually increase a PCP's use of referrals because he doesn't have to deal with it and it's not costing him any money. So capitation can work for other areas. Of course, there will be a completely different calculation of the PMPM per member per month. Um, and of course, it'll probably be based on lots more patients because, or lots, let me rephrase that, lots more members of the pool because hopefully not as many patients will be seeing the specialty groups or the specialty doctors as would be seeing a primary care doc. And you have to be sure if you're going to do this that you have tight control and that they will go to the cap capitated specialist either by designated by these primary care doctors who must go to these specialists or if you live in the Bronx, you must go to this one. If you live in Queens, you can go to this one. If you live in Mount Vernon, you can go to that one. And you have to figure out the carve-outs because specialists are going to definitely be doing other stuff. And the carve-outs, in a way, since they're paid almost like fee for services, can possibly induce overutilization. And you need to somehow ensure that the specialists do provide full services, although again, I do think there's ethics involved, and I like to not think that's as much of a problem as perhaps this slide implies. So you can take this even further, and you can have the IPA or the group receiving all the money, but not for hospital services would be one form of capitation. Uh, you really need a um, a very big group that can take capitation for primary care through specialty care. It has to be really big. And they really need to be almost their own insurance company and have all the systems to justify what they're doing. And a lot of HMOs aren't going to do this because they're not sure that the medical groups can really do this. But if you can, and you can run it very tightly, you can perhaps um, do very well. Um, I honestly can't think of any freestanding groups that this would work well with. However, staff models, HMOs, probably basically incorporate this in their actual plans. Um, global capitation means accepting the risk for everything. And it's going to require that umbrella policy called stop loss. And um, a management service organization or an integrated delivery system might try it, but I am not so sure that they would do it willingly. Well, there's also lots of federal regulations. And the federal regulations basically will apply to Medicare and Medicaid because they are getting direct support from the federal government. Medicare is fully federal funded, as you might recall, and Medicaid is funded by a combination of both federal and state monies. Uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, will determine whether physicians are at significant financial risk. And it'll be a sliding scale based on um, how big the panel is and what they think uh, the expenses are going to be. And of course, they must also have this umbrella policy because you really don't want physicians or anybody to have a perverse incentive not to be um, treating people. And um, you need to show 
what exactly is going on um, if you exceed the uh, financial risk. The state and the federal government want to see it. This is a very complex and not easily understood issue, but it's becoming more and more of an issue, the federal regulations, because of the increasing cost of both Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, there can be benefit issues that affect capitation, and um, the physician can be at risk for um, b the benefits. And so if they go up, um, the physician can be at high risk or low risk. Um, Co-payment levels can have a, an issue on capitation rates, and if you're working for more than one managed care organization or more than one group, difference in co-payment amounts can, can affect capitation rates, and we're not going to spend any time trying to factor in capitation rates, but when the money is actually paid to the physician, they factor in how much the copay they're getting is going to impact the per member per month they get. And, and the copay amount is going to vary depending on how many patients come in in any one month. So it's not simple, but with computers it seems to work out uh, reasonably well. Well, capitation isn't perfect. Um, there's always complications with any payment plan. For the point of service plans, it does allow them, of course, to stay within the HMO system, but gives them the option to go outside. So it's hard to predict what mix a particular patient will use. And so uh, it really is so difficult uh, that they kind of switched away from this and point of service plans are not really capitated anymore. Well, for HMOs, if they're strong enough, uh, it does bring uh, incentives in line to um, control some of the medical expenses and to ensure effective and proper utilization of services. It, it eliminates um, the fee for service, or shall we call it the piecework incentive, incentive for some doctors. Costs can be more easily predicted because they are uh, sort of fixed, and it's certainly easier to administer than a fee-for-service plan. For providers, uh, you can ensure a good cash flow, and if you're cost-effective, um, it can possibly be uh, more provide you with more compensation. Um, there's always a chance of risk, especially with small numbers, because you can get a patient who's an outlier who has a horrible disease. Um, and if um, patients are not coming in, are, there could be um, it may seem that the uh, capitation is not appropriate. There is the concern that MCOs are then therefore paying physicians not to do anything, and it clearly does reduce a member's ability to choose um, who they're going to go to. Um, the reward for physicians can be difficult because they're getting delayed gratification or delayed payment. Just because you're using doctors less, there may not be savings to the plan because certain things can be going uh, up in price or you could have the outlier. Uh, and physicians don't often give the plans the information they want because they're, they're, they're busy and it could be difficult. So it can um, affect the accuracy of their capitation numbers. Pay for performance. Well, this is an idea that's been in many different areas. They call it P4P. And it's basically an idea to align incentives with the practice of evidence-based medicine. 
and it's focused more on what doctors are doing than on any particular cost savings. Um, let's just say a little bit about evidence-based medicine. A lot of doctors do things because they just think it works rather than based on sound scientific evidence. There are many different levels of evidence-based medicine and that just makes it more complex and I am going to kind of leave it at that for this particular discussion. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are trying this primarily just to save money, Medicare, employer groups, individual plans, and the UK is trying to implement something like this because uh, in the UK the National Public Health Service, which in many ways is a giant public health plan, um, is having some significant financial issues. It's nothing new. Many of you have seen articles or perhaps are aware from news reports over the years that people in the United Kingdom may have to wait a very long time, particularly for those procedures that are considered elective. Well, can we do a group performance versus an individual performance for physicians? Well, maybe if the geography is large enough or if it's a large medical group or if you have a lot of one specialty in an area, but it's very hard to measure. And the primary focus is on primary care because these are the guys that can control access to everything else. There is, they are trying to use uh, some of this in specialty care, but I don't know quite how far that's going to get. And you also have manual versus automated data collection issues, which can be problematic, particularly today with EMRs. Um, there were a whole bunch of different ways to do this. Bonus payments are most common because that's easy to calculate. Fee adjustment can be a challenge. Uh, capitated plan incentive pools, that means, well, you know, if you're below a certain level, we give you more. It can be kind of tough to figure out. And there are a lot of different other methods to do things that we're not going to spend uh, much time on. Well, we could, like I said in the beginning, we could spend a whole semester on how to pay people. So one of the things they, they're thinking of doing for specialties is maybe looking at certain areas, like for congestive heart failure. Are you using the right drugs? Are we count, do, doing dietary counseling? Uh, smoking cessation, diabetes is a whole list of issues and the logic of perhaps picking these two would be very simple. Congestive heart failure is really a horrible disease. There is no cure for it and the actual survival rate, the five-year survival rate, is usually worse than cancer. Right now the only cure for congestive heart failure is a heart transplant. Uh, diabetes is in the news all the time about um, how much medical care it's costing the U.S., how prevalent the disease is, so uh, I don't think I really need to spend much time on that. So when you're doing a pay-for-performance plan, you need lots of data, and it's not that easy. Uh, medical claims is obviously a, a good use. Uh, inpatient episodes, just to go through a few of them, may or may not be. Just because you're an inpatient doesn't mean, you know, something went wrong. Um, patient surveys, I'm not a big fan of because there's a lot of emotional areas there. Pharmacy claims can be relatively simple to look at, and so can laboratory results. But basically, what you should get from this slide is there's a lot of ways to measure this and that just perhaps adds to the confusion, the complexity and difficulty of doing this particular idea. Well, we don't really know if it works. Uh, certain uh, groups like the CMS do think it works. Um, providers and academic centers will report it doesn't, particularly if you're focused on good care anyway. So 
basically what you really need to do is wait and see and maybe we need to do some more pilot programs um, you know it's like he says she says and it's a tough area to follow it's not like how many widgets are you making for three dollars and what is the quality of them you know the quality of medical care sometimes can be hard to determine so that's why paying for performance P4P is a bit of a cloudy area in my opinion so basically what you should take away is it's really hard to change behavior and you're not going to stop cost inflation uh, just by provide, figuring out how providers are paid it's much more complex than that well when there are different models physicians are going one is going to win um, again physicians are not going to alter their behavior they're generally going to practice right and if you have the ability to do a high margin procedure you're probably going to still do it but if most of the money comes from one particular model that's what the physicians are going to be most influenced by and that just makes common sense there's always a way to game the system we see it all the time and what he what is said here is the quote payment models payment models are no substitute for close management or actual management regardless of it being medical care or anything else is probably right on well hospitals and facilities also need to be paid and everybody knows how much money a hospitalization can cost and this can become a significant um, issue for the managed care organizations because believe me if anybody's going to see a um, six thousand I mean a six digit bill it's going to be from a hospital why is there such a focus on it well look at this chart I think it shows you pretty well the inflation rate of hospital bills one of the issues is hospitals are clearly combining to have competitive advantages and negotiating advantages and certain hospitals are clearly must have in a situation like how can a decent managed care plan in say New York City not have Columbia and if you think about the Affordable Care Act one of the early complaints about it in fact were that for some plans you didn't have uh, really good hospitals in there and really good hospitals didn't want to use them lots of different payment methodologies just like we have in the situation for paying other providers uh, this just shows you a chart of the different ways that things can be done um, and they are slightly different for outpatient centers as compared to hospitals and we'll go over this a little bit well the charge master people have heard about um, that's the uh, crazy thing where you know uh, it's $38 for an aspirin and they settle for 10 cents um, is it a work of fiction sort of uh, just think of your own lab bills if you or, or, or if you get an insurance statement with an EOB it'll show you uh, I can remember one for some routine blood work I had it showed a bill of fourteen hundred dollars for the charge master bill and after the insurance company you know showed what they negotiated it came down to hundred and twenty so the charge master is there unfortunately in the courts when the hospital had hospitals have occasionally sued people without insurance to pay charge master bills believe it or not the courts upheld it so while it's there and it's not really used these sticker pricers um, uh, can sometimes come back and hang somebody although most reasonable hospitals will um, negotiate down if for no other reason than the publicity there are many different billing code systems the most common one 
is the International Classifications of Diseases, the ICD-10. There's the HCSPS, which is an older form of, call of common procedural coding systems. And of course, there's DRGs and then diagnostic related groups. And then there's actually a Medicare subsection called MSDRGs. And all that this does, frankly, is add to the complexity, and that's actually a Medicare severity DRG, and we'll talk briefly about that as we move ahead. Well, payments are usually based on charges. Um, the, you know, if it's authorized, the, the, pan, the plan will pay the full obligation. There can be cost sharing. Uh, there are discounts. I discussed that um, briefly in the last slide regarding labs. Um, most hospitals do have scales, and they're all based as a percentage of the charge master, and that percentage can be very, very small in certain occasion, in certain cases. Uh, one nice way to do it with, uh, that they would like is a per diem. You walk into the hospital and you're in there. This is what you get for each day. There will be some differences, differences based on what you're in there for. There may be a higher payment for the first day if it's more, you know, more care the first day. And there's always the potential for, you know, negotiation with sliding scales and whatever else a health insurance agency or HMO can work out with the institution. Well, DRGs were first used in Medicare. And basically, it says, um, we will pay you X amount of dollars for this DRG, for this diagnostic-related code. So if you walk in with a MI, a simple MI, myocardial infarction, the hospital will get $10,000. Um, if you can do it for $6,000, you keep the difference. If it costs you more than 10000 it comes out of your pockets. There can be, uh, and usually is an adjustment made for particularly severely ill patients, and these are called outliers, and adjustments can be made in the DRG for that. Medicare, because they generally teach, uh, teach, excuse me, they treat older and more severe patients, they do have these MS, as we discussed earlier, um, DRGs where they do take this into account right from the start. Uh, there may be some uh, fewer outliers, but the way medicine is changing and patients are going into the hospital sicker and sicker, uh, this doesn't always. Um, this is really episode uh, treatment groups is another method of trying to figure out how to do things. Um, case rates, um, basically, it's like an almost like a <laughs> going to a, a a a resort and paying one price for all, but there are certain extra things. It, it may not include a device. Um, this may even be used more in a long-term care center, perhaps, than an institution. Uh, capitation is similar to what is done by hospitals, uh, by doctors. Uh, it's very complex. It's really not used as much as it used to be. Um, a percent of premium revenue where a certain amount goes to the hospital, um, that can work if the hospital owns the HMO. Uh, again, not used very often. Capitation didn't really work very well, and just as in private um, doctor cases, you do have to have a stop loss or what I would call an umbrella policy. Carve-outs are interesting. Um, this is where you pay extra for certain specific things, like if you take a cruise and everything's included, everything's included except the drinks, and you can buy a drink package for extra money, you can buy this package for extra money. So that's kind of what a carve-out is. Payers would like to reduce them to control their prices. Hospitals would like to increase them because it can be very profitable. 
and um, there are just a whole bunch of different ways to do this. Well, what about ambulatory procedures? Pretty much the same thing. Uh, the prices are negotiated by the HMOs or the managed care organizations. Again, there may be something similar to a charge master and most of these insurance companies will get a discount. Uh, the other thing is there is an incentive to keep you out of the hospital, so there may be a lower copay or no copay if you go to an ambulatory care center for a procedure. And again, um, things can be bundled any which way that they can negotiate. And if you have a really bad problem, um, outliers can be paid at a higher rate, although I wouldn't think that's much of an issue in ambulatory care surgery. Uh, since th those type of things are generally far more predictable. Otherwise, they wouldn't be done in an ambulatory care place. They would be done in a hospital site. Um, there, there can be payment classification systems. It is used by Medicare. And um, commercial payers often will base things on Medicare rates and pay more or less, usually not less, but a higher percentage than Medicare. Um, often, a lot of things are not even covered by private insurance companies until Medicare pays for it. Um, there can be modifiers, and it's, if it is a carve-out, it's similar to an inpatient carve-out. Well, what are ancillary service? This is all the other things that can go on and that you need, like radiology, testing, and um, they have to be covered also. They're generally not decided by the patient, but the doctor, of course, tells you to go for it. And it's not unreasonable for the patient to be expected to travel to receive these services because they're not in the hospital. There are issues with that. Um, if it's owned by the hospital, it, it can be negotiable. If it's owned separately, it's a whole nother um, type of negotiation. And the issue of physician-owned labs is, and a conflict of interest is coming up more and more. And actually, some physicians or groups have had fines, or some people have gone to jail over this um, conflict of interest. They often are capitated by an HMO, and non-HMOs like a POS, as I discussed with my own lab bill, will pay a hugely discounted fee for these types of services. Global fees are pretty straightforward. You know, one fee for all. Um, it's being pushed by Medicare because um, you can then theoretically um, quantify what you're doing, and it also eliminates some of the uh, unbundling and upcoding issues that can occur with other payment methodologies. Just because there are so many, uh, you know, acronyms here, MedPAC is the Medicare Payment Advisory uh, Commission for Medicare. Well, global fees can be a hybrid, meaning of capitation and fee-for-service. Uh, so it is not really risk sharing, so anybody can use it who will accept it. It really depends on how you figure out how to share the money. And the Affordable Care Act is, try, again, experimenting with 10 uh, common and relatively expensive conditions to see what happens. And uh, they're trying to apply payment to all the care provided for these episodes, including 30 days after discharge. One of the things Medicare is doing that may or may not have an impact, and it will have a clear impact on, on, on managed care uh, organizations, is if you let a patient out of the hospital too soon and they come back in, the Medicare will not pay for that admission and you have to eat it. Um, particularly with certain infectious diseases, this is an al also an issue if you pick up an infection in the hospital, Medicare may not pay for it now. Again, they're trying to use, I guess, financial coercion to improve care. There's other experiments going on with the Affordable Care Act, and they're listed here, 
and we'll just have to see how they really work. Uh, we're not sure yet. The Affordable Care Act, as you know, is a work in progress. Um, health information technology may allow more people to be treated at home if, for things like monitoring. Um, diagnostic imaging may come under some more control. Medication therapy management, one of the big problems is a lot of times people don't take their medicines right. And as medicines are becoming more complex, this might be an area where we can prevent hospitalizations. And the more the patient understands, it seems reasonable, the better the uh, compliance with the disease uh, treatment should be. Uh, things are being... Um, tested all the time, including integrated care, and they are looking at several other areas. Post-acute care might be something interesting that may grow where you're in that funny spot where you're really too sick to be to, to go home, but not sick enough to be in the hospital. Maybe they can find through long-term care facilities where this is actually going on now, a, a, a more cost-effective interim bed for you till you're ready to go home. Uh, electronic monitoring, collaboration, uh, comprehensive payments. This list is long and the list is long because medical care is complex, payment is complex, and with the increasing cost of, of care, I don't think, and the need to control it, I don't think it's going to get simpler anytime soon.